Dear colleagues, in partnership with Nephrology Dialysis Transplantation, NDT, the official journal of the European Renal Association, Markus at Home welcomes Dr. Sanjeev Sethi and Dr. Fernando Ferventa in Rochester, Minnesota, with whom we would like to discuss pathogenesis, classification, and treatment of membranous nephropathy. Dear Sanjeev, thanks for joining us tonight. Dear Fernando, welcome back at Marcus at Home after our 2021 discussion. It's a privilege to host the two of you. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. Dr. Sanjeev Sethi is pathologist specializing in the diagnosis of kidney disease, and Dr. Fernando Ferventa is nephrologist. Both are global leaders in the diagnosis and treatment of membranous nephropathy, co-authors of the 2021 KDGO JN guidelines, and initiators of the recent Mayo Clinic consensus report, which proposed a novel classification for membranous nephropathy. Among their numerous 2023 papers, they have just published a state-of-the-art review in NDT, which is our NDT's pick of the month. And with this, I'll hand over the microphone to my co-moderator, Andreas Kronbichler. Well, thank you, Gunnar. I think we will uh, start with a presentation by Sanjeev and Fernando. And then we will go over to a hopefully lively discussion on diagnosis and treatment of membranous nephropathy and what we have achieved over the past two decades. Thank you once again, uh, Gunnar and Andreas, for having me on this. The talk is mostly, I would say, for about 70% dedicated to the discovery of the new antigens, how it came about. And then uh, towards the end, we'll talk about... Uh, what we should do with the new antigens and, and the role of the new classification of uh, membranous nephropathy. So that's the title of the talk. Uh, really just a few housekeeping slides. One is that this is a most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in the adult white patients. The incidence tends to increase in the older patients. Mean age is 50 to 60. Tends to be a little bit male dominance, two is to one. Somewhat rare in children. More often, especially for us, it's a fairly common diagnosis because we see a lot of white patients. I had three cases out of my eight or 10 cases yesterday of membranes. So not all that uncommon. Uh, Asians, Black, Hispanics, we all have it. Incidence is about 10 to 20 per million per year. So as you can see in the US with a population of about 400 million, that's about 8,000 new cases per year. So not all that uncommon, a fairly common diagnosis in uh, places that see quite a bit of kidney biopsies. Uh, the biopsy findings is really very simple and very easy. I mean, this is a really the no-brainer of renal biopsy diagnosis because once you see the granular IgG along the capillary walls, nothing else quite looks like this. I always tell my residents and fellows to please go look at the IgG. So the IgG bright granular staining along the capillary walls is diagnostic of membranous nephropathy in my mind. Sometimes some diseases like fibrillary or can occasionally look like this, but really nothing else quite looks like this. Keep in mind that the granular IgG is really three plus bright staining. Early staining can have one plus, two plus, but in general, this is what it looks like. Now, obviously the IgG is targeting an antigen underneath. So you have antigen antibody complexes. On electron microscopy, that is represented by these large sub-epithelial electron dense deposits. And that's what the arrows are pointing at. Between the deposits, you get a basement membrane uh, sort of a reaction. That's the large arrows. And this is what we call spikes. So spikes are this material between the deposits. And the deposits themselves do not stain on a PAS and silver stain. And these often appear as what we call pinholes. So pinholes and spikes are sort of diagnostic of membranous nephropathy. The deposits are sub-epithelial in location, indicating either porosite, most likely porosite shedding of the antigen and then the antibody response. Because they are sub-epithelial, there is no inflammatory response. And this is what the light microscopy shows. As you can see, the glomerular basin membranes are thickened, but there is no inflammation there. And the reason being that these deposits are sub-epithelial. For pathologists who deal with this every day, you can see the thickened GBM very easily. And if you look at high power, uh, you can also see these spikes and pinholes. But the take home message here is they thick in GBM with the absence of any inflammatory cells in there. And of course, there is this granular IgG. Now, for the longest time, at least when I did my residency and fellowships in the 1990s and early 2000s, uh, 
membranous nephropathy by and large was classified very simply as many other diseases are FSGS and PG and come to mind into primary and secondary. Primary meaning there was no disease association and this formed the bulk of membranous nephropathy. But we also knew that there were many membranous nephropathy that were sort of associated with known sort of uh, underlying diseases. The big one, of course, is autoimmune disease like lupus. We all know lupus membranous nephritis really well. But other diseases like infections, you know, syphilis, hepatitis, for example, drugs, uh, heavy metals, and then everybody knows about tumors, sarcoid, stem cell transplant. All of these were known to be associated with membranous. Although the exact etiology was not understood, but we knew these diseases were associated with membranous, and we called it secondary membranous nephropathy. So if you look at the classification, it was kind of what a lot of other disease entities in, 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 the, in the kidney world are sort of, okay? So the antigen that was responsible for causing this massive deposition of IgG along the capillary walls really remained uh, elusive for a long time. I mean, there were other studies suggesting it, but really in the clinical scenario, um, yeah, these were not that relevant. And then came, of course, this huge paper in 2009 that, uh, showed uh, by Dr. Beck and Salant and their group that clearly showed that the PLA2R was a target antigen in, in, in this idiopathic uh, particular group over here. Okay. And this was followed by 2014 by another one, thrombospondin 7A. And this was this is really rare. And we, I basically see one, if I'm lucky, uh, case per year. So this is relatively rare, but this was the huge deal. And this was in 2009. Almost every lab now around the world stains for PLA2R now. This is how we do it here at the Mayo Clinic. And you can see this nice granular PLA2R staining that mirrors the IgG staining. This is a PLA2R stain. And so the biopsy from 2011 or 12, since we started doing them and the rest of the world divided membranous nephropathy into PLA2R positive and PLA2R negative, essentially. Okay, so that was the, the classification that came about and to some extent existed until very recently into PLA2R positive membranous and PLA2R negative membranous, keeping in mind that thrombospondin 7A is extremely rare. So PLA2R, as we know, a changed membranous nephropathy. I don't need to go into this in detail. Uh, the clinicians now follow PLA, make the diagnosis of PLA of membranous nephropathy based on PLA2R titer, they follow the treatment and so on. Okay. So this is the existing classification of membranous nephropathy, okay? I mean, when we got into this. So here's membranous nephropathy based on PLA2R and thrombospondin. This is primary and this is secondary, as you can see. It's primary 70%. This accounts for about 70% over here. Rest of the entire secondary list, we had no target antigens, okay? So it was all a red box. And in reality, we were grouping all of these antigens, you know, regardless of what the disease entity was, you know, regardless whether it was stem cell transplant, regardless whether it was autoimmune disease, regardless whether it was a tumor, we had lumped them all into PLA2R negative membranous nephropathy. And that's how the story was until very recently. You know, some background, we sort of were doing this mentor study with the, the Fernando and the idea at that time what stuck us was, hey, maybe we can find these antigens. It shouldn't be that difficult to find these antigens because the basic immunology is one IgG is one target antigen, right? And there is lots and lots of IgG present there. So in other words, there should be lots and lots of target antigen present in these glomeruli. That was a basic principle. So what we said was, hey, let's dissect these glomeruli uh, sort of and subject it to mass spectrometry and come up with the protein sort of uh, data on these particular glomeruli. And the idea was that this particular protein, if it is truly the antigen, should really be present in large amounts. We're not looking for a needle in a haystack. We're looking at the haystack itself in these particular cases, right? Because there's large amounts of antigen out there. I mean, each IgG is one, one antigen there. So of course, the first step was to look for PLA2R. We dissected some glomeruli that are PLA2R positive. I won't go into the details here, but you can clearly see we picked up PLA2R in every case. It was very easy to pick up. This, this, this is what the mass spec looks like. This is one case. These are total spectral counts. A spectral count of five or 10 is considered quite high. Look over here, 90, 80, 70, 80. So 
very large spectral counts of PLA2R in this particular glomer of each case. So very easy to find PLA2R. So the next step, of course, was, hey, listen, let's dissect some glomeruli that are PLA2R negative, completely random. I mean, just picked out randomly five, 10 cases of PLA2R negative, did the exact same story. And to our surprise, we found a protein called exostosin 1 and 2 in the first five of the first 15 cases we did. Uh, I won't go into the, into the details, but this is what a readout looks like. We get about 10 pages of this readout. But if you look, oh, just to give you a rough idea, everything else is really small amounts, 5, 10, 7, 5, 4, and these are all housekeeping genes, okay? So, but look at this, 90 and 80, so really high count. So again, like I said, it was not looking at the needle, we were looking at the haystack itself. So looking at large amounts of protein out there. So very easy to find the exostosin. These are just in another 25 cases. So we kept doing more and more, easily picked up the exostosin, no problem at all in many cases. And of course, for me as a pathologist, sure, so what if we picked up a protein, you know? And what does it mean? It could just be a mesangial protein. I want to see the granular IgG staining mirrored in each case, just like we did to the PLA2R. So of course we did the of course we did the the, the IHC and found the beautiful granular staining for exostosin one and two. The problem is we've not yet found the antibody in these cases, and I'll come to that in a little bit. But bottom line was with the exostosin, we found these were females, these were young patients. They had autoimmune serologies. Many of them had a diagnosis of lupus. So the take home message was we had probably found the target antigen for an autoimmune disease associated membranous nephropathy. Okay, so this was the first one that we discovered, and this was 2017 to 2018. But what exostosin taught us, because this took a long time to get published, it took two, two and a half years for people to believe this was maybe the real deal. We found that what we had to do is one, number one, find the protein on mass spec. Number two, find the granular staining along the GBM. Number three, they, we figured this out through the reviewers that they wanted us to do confocal studies to show that that new antigen or new protein that you detected, and it shows the granular GBM staining is indeed binding to the IgG, so shows that confocal. And of course, lastly, they want us to discover the antibody in circulation not only find the antibody in circulation, but see if it correlates with proteinuria and treatment. And whether we like it or not, people wanted us to do validation assays with other unknown uh, uh, cases. So based on this, we, we continued. Okay, so I'm going to go a little fast. The next one we detected, just in terms of the numbers, okay? So NEL1 was another antigen, another protein that appeared to be unique in many cases of PLA2R negative membranous nephropathy. So we kept doing more and more and we kept seeing more and more NEL1. It wasn't even an issue to find NEL1. And this is the granular staining for NEL1. You can see the beautiful granular staining. NEL1, for some reason or the other, also showed a few cases that was segmental staining, not complete uh, all the loops. The below is just showing you some, some control cases. So fairly straightforward NEL1. Now we knew how to do the confocal. This was done in Dr. Ronko's lab uh, uh, with the help of uh, Hannah Debick. Beautiful staining for NEL1, beautiful staining for IgG, and they completely overlap, you can see over here. So we knew that the IgG was binding to NEL1. In this particular case, we had good luck. We found a serum in these patients and were able to find the antibodies. Furthermore, the antibodies disappeared upon treatment and when the proteinuria went down. So this was the second antigen we found, and it, to us, it appears as the second most uh, common target antigen in patients with membranous nephropathy. Uh, this is a, a slide that I just put together because NEL1 is probably the most heterogeneous of all antigens now. Many of these don't have an underlying disease, uh, so they are primary in that sense, but you can see NEL1 in almost every other setting of secondary membranous nephropathy. The third one we found was semaphorin. This we did not have that many cases, but this particular antigen, again, looking, doing more and more cases was extremely unique in that these patients we found were young patients. This was a pediatric age group. In fact, I think 70% of our patients were less than two years of age. So this was really a pediatric antigen and we were able to find uh, the, the antibody in these cases as well. So this was the third antigen we found. 
extremely unique in that it's a pediatric antigen. We have seen a few cases in the 30s and 40s, but in general, this is present in really young children. And there was also a manuscript recently showing recurrence in the transplant. This is a very progressive uh, membranous um, kind of uh, nephropathy. In other words, it does get to end-state kidney disease if they are not treated. Fourth one we found as we continued our quest for finding more antigens, doing more and more cases of protocaterin 7. This was an interesting antigen in that this was in patients who were older, and these patients had very little complement activation in them. Most of these patients went into spontaneous remission and had good outcomes in almost all cases of protocaterin 7. It's not extremely common, about 2 to 3% in our series. Now that we had exhausted many of these antigens in terms of just doing more and more cases, we took a targeted approach now to find the remaining antigen. So we took our stem cell transplant patients and did the same story. And when we dissected these glomerulite of membranous nephropathy in the setting of stem cell transplant, what we found was a unique protein called FAT1. Almost every case of GVHD or stem cell transplant associated membranous nephropathy is FAT1 positive. I mean, I've got many cases now, referrals from outside, uh, including Europe and within the US, almost every case is, is FAT1. Again, this is a sort of a membranous nephropathy that is progressive and does need treatment. Uh, so it is quite unique in that sense. We have two more that we have discovered last year. Again, this was syphilis. If you know syphilis is up on the rise, the most common cause of uh, membranous of, of proteinuria and syphilis is membranous nephropathy. They are almost invariably PLA2R negative. And all of our syphilis patients with membranous nephropathy had NDNF. The problem with, with well, it's not really a problem. These patients are treated with penicillin and then the proteinuria goes away. So it's tough getting hold of serum samples in these patients because by the time we get them, they're already in, in remission. Okay, so that's syphilis. And this is the last one. This is PCSK6. And this we found in patients with NSAIDs. So patients who have NSAID-associated membranous nephropathy are often PCSK6 positive, okay? And that was that. So if you look at this whole picture right now, everything that was read, we did not know five or six years ago. And you can clearly see that the entire box is quite full. There are a couple in here that I want to mention that we did not discover, just so that it doesn't look like everything was done by us. Uh, NCAM1 was done by the Arcana group, and this is pre pre predominantly in the autoimmune disease. Contactin1 was done by the French and also a Canadian group, um, which is predominantly seen in patients with polyneuropathies. But really, the entire group, the, the whole map is now quite filled up. Okay, so quick recap and last couple of slides. Just exostosin is autoimmune disease. NEL1 is really heterogeneous all over the place. PCDH7, older patients, no complement, semaphore in pediatrics, NCAM1 autoimmune again, FAT1 stem cell transplant, contactin1 is demyelinating diseases, NTNG1 is another really rare primary, NDNF syphilis, and PCSK6 is, is NSAIDs. So you have the whole story together now. Because of all the discovery of all these antigens, uh, Fernando, arranged this uh, Mayo Clinic meeting, consensus meeting last year, to take a look at what where we should go with these all these uh, antigens that we have discovered. And the main consensus was that, listen, in this day and age of personalized medicine and with all these antigens that we can detect, a, a real serious attempt should be made in determining what the antigen, the underlying antigen is in every particular case. Of course, many of these are associated with secondary disease, and most of these you can see are very clear-cut, the secondary disease that are associated with them. So if you have a patient with, say, for example, NCAM1, you have to work these patients up for autoimmune disease. If you have a NEL1, think malignancy, same thing with thrombospondin, and so on, NDNF syphilis, okay? So here is a rough idea, at least based on the Mayo Clinic mass spec data. pla 2 are obviously the largest piece of the pie, 55%. Exostocin and NEL1 are the next two large ones. The remaining are between 1% to 3%, and there's still about 10% that we would probably, we don't really know. The final summary for me is it's critical that we base membranous nephropathy on the target antigen. 
each target antigen, I, because I'm going fast, you know, each target antigen really has specific clinical and pathologic features uh, that cannot be ignored. And I think serologic testing of the antibody needs to become available very soon. But unless we diagnose these patients with the target antigen, this is not going to come around. This will only come around once we have more and more cases of, of these specific new target antigens. And I will stop here uh, and let Fernando come in. Oh, of course, okay. I cannot thank, uh, do these uh, studies on my own. Uh, Pierre Ronco, Ahana Debikir, and Fernando, my big drivers of this. Ben Madden over here is my mass spec guru. There's no way I could have done this without him. I swear I did a lot of my clinical work. Some of the Westerns were done by Marta. And then Vivian and Luan Gross, of course, do all the IHC work for me. A lot of other people to thank as well, but this is this is the main group. You told us there were only 10% of all patients remaining in whom you did oh, not yet yeah. have found the antibody. Do you believe there will be an antibody in everybody? So will there be in, say, five or 10 years, 100% coverage for antibodies? Or may there be some people remaining? Okay, so... There are another five or 10%. We have what's called the putative antigens. That means in these particular patients, they're so rare that we don't have large number of cases. Uh, they are not well characterized so far, unlike the eight or 10 that I have presented to you. Uh, so there are those ones, but I feel that another 5% will come around and then 5% you will not know. This is almost like the amyloid story, if you think about amyloid. So AL amyloid is about 60, 70%. Then, uh, depending upon where you live, of course, and the rest of it is A amyloid and all the hereditary amyloids. And even with amyloids, about five odd percent, you really don't know what the underlying etiology is. Pretty much the same thing over here. My gut feeling is five percent of them you may not find an find an antigen. May I just ask two more questions? Yeah, actually? go ahead. So, um, I think this is this is really great. So we have really characterized the patients, but most of the centers are not able to stain for all these antigens. Yeah. Is there any so, chance that there is a commercial, let's say, multiplex uh, immunofluorescence test coming up to stain for that? So not that I know of, but there are two things we can do with this when, I, uh, when people ask me that. So I think most labs do PLA-2R, that's a given. So when you do a PLA-2R, for example, I had three cases yesterday. Uh, one is PLA-2R positive, the remaining two are PLA-2R negative, just from last yesterday. So the PLA-2R this morning I looked at before I came here, it was PLA-2R positive, the remaining two are PLA-2R negative. So what I do is at the Mayo, we order a small panel. It's really just taking care of NEL1 mm -hmm. and taking care of exostosin. So as, a, as soon as you do NEL1 and exostosin, you've also already moved up to the 75, 80% bracket, okay? And now if you can, so that's what I, I already ordered these two, and we also do semaphorin uh, for simply because it's an easy stain to do. The protocadherins, PCD8, 7, and FAT1 are cadherins, so there's a lot of background uh, fuzziness, so we have not yet started doing that. So what I suggest to people, do a PLA2R, and then if that is negative, you order the rest of the panel that are not very difficult to do. We do thrombospondin 7A because we've been doing it for a while, even though we don't see any positive cases, but it's just routine reflex. And then we do a NEL and we do an exostosin. Believe me, we are, we, you're quite surprised by how many cases you will detect by just doing these three stains. And we are at a semaphorin. We picked up a few adults uh, semaphorins as a result. The remaining are going to be tough to do on a regular basis. So what I would suggest is there should be one auth center doing those stains. So if you have a patient with syphilis or you have a patient with stem cell transplant, then you can, I mean, these are not immediate. You don't have to do it right away. So you could have a dedicated place doing, say, for example, fat one. You send it to us, we can do stem cell transplant. We could pick it up and so on. You know, the older patients, protocadherin seven, if the rest of it is negative. So you could have a sort of a folks IHC done in labs. Um, it's not that difficult to establish an IHC for these. We at the Mayo will be offering, a, like I saw a Twitter today, we will be offering a, a mass spec test, I think within three, within the next three odd months. Uh, so it's very simple. You just send the block and we can do mass spectrometry and then tell you what the underlying antigen is. Like I said, in about 90% of these. That's amazing. 
And the next one is about the segmental staining of NEL1 because the others are really full-blown positive yeah. and co-localized. Do you have any explanation why this is the case? So some of these NEL ones are tumor associated and you wonder if the if it's the antigen is being made by the tumor or it has or the same uh, sort of cytokines or whatever involved with the tumor are then simulating the porocytes. So maybe it, those tumor associated ones tend to be segmental, not, not the remaining ones. Uh, so I think there's a paper by the Columbia group that showed that this segmental staining is mostly tumor and those are NEL1. So I'm not sure what, how exactly, but my feeling is it's the tumor ones that are segmental. Perfect. Then I think we can move on to uh, Dr. Favenza. Thank you, Gunnar and um, uh, Andrea. So I will pre I, I see Andrea has asked me to talk um, about um, briefly what to do beyond uh, rituximab um, in patients with members of the property, how to treat them. So I'm just going to illustrate two cases, and I see I take the opportunity to emphasize what we uh, wrote back in 2016, all right, when we, we wrote this proposal for a serological based approach for members of the property. And I think this, the serological based approach was based in our clinical experience here of seeing these patients. Remember that Mayo Clinic was the first center in the United States because it was doing validation study for immune. So we are the first center that offered anti-PLA2R uh, testing for patients with nephropathy. So we had uh, a long uh, uh, experience of uh, doing that. And the first thing we proposed at that time in 2016 is that if a patient, again, based on the clinical uh, uh, experience, is that if you have a patient that has nephrotic syndrome and you measure PLA2R and PLA2R was positive and you didn't find any secondary cause, meaning that the patient had no hepatitis, no lupus, no malignancy, and no drugs. And that patient in principle had PLA2R associated member of the property and you should didn't need to do a biopsy, you should just go ahead and uh, treat this patient accordingly. Of course, this was a proposal and it, this slide is quite complicated, but was good in one sense because the reviewers were concentrated in all this business here and they left us alone here. This was just a proposal, but for which we had no data whatsoever, all right? But then we went through, it went by because they got distracted over here. So then with time we had, well, we have to better find this data. And indeed, uh, we uh, we link with at that time Shane Bobar, who now works at uh, 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 in Texas at the, in Houston at the Methodist Hospital. There, um, we got he was a fellow at that time. We got and said, let's review our experience uh, while all the samples we have done with members of, with PLA to R and Mayo, and we have over fifteen hundred uh, samples in, and we found about one hundred and sixty patients, etc. To cut on the story short, we found that those patients that have a normal EGFR, meaning a EGFR greater than 60, no secondary cause of member nephropathy, and um, no diabetes. The biopsy didn't show anything more than PLA2R associated member nephropathy, so we proposed that that was irrelevant. You didn't need to biopsy those patients. But of course, a lot of people say, ah, this is just the Mayo Clinic, blah, 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 and I have a lot of friends, etc., who love to biopsy. So we then geared uh, together with uh, Andrew Bombach at Columbia and Maria Jose Soler at uh, Barcelona. And again, we managed to get another 101 patients there. And when we divided those patients with more than 60%, no secondary cause, we found the same thing. And there's no diabetes. Biopsy didn't, con didn't give you any other uh, information that was relevant uh, to those patients. And uh, so we confirmed in a validation study that that was true. The other thing that we put into that review is, and I think that KDGO guidelines have now uh, taken this up, you know, and it says that if a patient is in that characteristic, you, you can consider bypassing the biopsy and uh, just treating the patient accordingly. Now, this all is clear that the patient has no secondary and normal kidney function. This does not apply if the EGFR is less than 60. What we proposed at that time is that not only use the PLA2R or to diagnose it, but also to use the PLA to our titer to gear uh, uh, treatment. And what we said at that time, and of course this can be modified uh, because this was back in 2016, all right? 
uh, well, it was published in 2016, but we wrote that paper probably in 2015, whatever. So what we said in the following, the patient has a um, uh, of the property. You are going to, is purely to our positive. You are going to treat this patient with whatever you want to treat, either Monticelli or Rituximab or calcineur inhibitor. And by six months, the patient has more than 90% reduction in antibody, then you should consider stop immunosuppressive therapy. Now, this consider stop immunosuppressive therapy is another colossal amount of BS. Because we know that if you give cyclophosphamide, for example, we did in the RAVE study, for example, that the patient with vasculitis were treated with prednisone cyclophosphamide, right? cyclophosphamide has caused profound depletion in B cells. And some of these patients were B cell depleted at 18 months. And the same is rituximab. To say that you consider, you know, I stop it, nothing. Because once you gave rituximab or cytoxin, goodbye, it's done, all right? So the only thing that this is really applicable is for patients when you are giving calcineurin inhibitor, because then you stop and then a few couple of weeks later, there is no more effect there. Yeah. And we said that um, if the patient has six months, there is reduction, it's still positive. And by the way, we should just now say that the immunological remission of uh, 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 members, this, if we want to modify this slide, I would say that the, the immunological remission is not 90% greater, is to 100%. So immunological remission in members of the property has to be at negative PLA to our antibody level, less than two by immune. all right? And what we say now at that time that if you, by six months, the PLA to R came down more than 50%, well, then the patient is responding, then you just need to continue doing whatever you do. But if there is no change in, or little change in PLA to R, then it's unlikely this patient, you need to modify immunosuppressive therapy. And then this, I take the, the last few minutes then to illustrate two cases where you, I think it's important to use this, uh, how we think about here and how we use the PLA to R. So this is a patient that comes, uh, I mean, he was like 45 years old, something like that. He came with a creatinine of 1.5 and a proteinuria about 15 grams, and he was treated with rituximab, two doses. And you can see that uh, this is, I mean, this is all mess around, but this is 2015, 2016, 17. So we have, this is 2023, all right? And you can see that initially for the first three months, the proteinuria somehow did came back or right, down, all right? But it then immediately went up. But look at what happened to the creatinine. The creatinine was 1.5. And then it went to 2 and 2.5 and 3 in a matter of like um, uh, uh, from uh, uh, August, you can see here from August to January. All right. So in a matter of five months, the patient had lost from 1.5 to a creatinine of 3.3. And at that time, we, we said that is not possible. This patient is, uh, is uh, losing kidney function, is not responding to rituxima. And we gave, this is what we give at Mayo. We do use cyclophosphamide, but we don't. I don't believe, for example, that you need to use the cyclic uh, three grams on months one, three, and nine on and five because that is equal to nine grams of metalprednisone. And in my view, this is criminal. Um, you are over treating those patients. So what I do here, I may where I just give one gram of metalprednisone, and then I patient I put the patient on oral cyclophosphamide together with uh, uh, with prednisone, 20 milligrams, on a daily basis. And I follow, of course, a uh, leukocyte uh, count every week to make sure that the leukocyte doesn't go uh, below four. And we adjust the dose of cyclophosphamide according with age and kidney function. And you can see that with this regime, all right, that the patient was on this for four months. And then look at that. This proteinuria went from 15 grams, went down, 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 down. And then um, the patient just did the labs like a week ago. And here it is, his proteinuria right to the bottom. But of course, this is how we illustrate how you use the PLA to R because it was obvious that the answer to this, it was not responding because Rituximab was making no impact on the PLA to R that remained high, 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 high. And then after a couple of months on prednisone and cyclophosphamide, you see the PLA2R become absolutely negative and has remained negative for all these years, all right? And the patient has gone there. So this is how you use the PLA2R. PLA2R, no move, change here because it's not going. PLA2R, and I, the other thing to tell you is that 
you can use the PLA2R also to cut immunosuppressive therapy. There is no reason to give six months of prednisone and cyclophosphamide if two months after you do this, the PLA2R has gone. So my recommendation is that you put this patient, treat for two months, PLA2R is negative, then maybe you keep, keep another two or four weeks to consolidate and then goodbye. So this gives minimal uh, cumulative dose of cyclophosphamide, minimal cumulative dose of prednisone, and you reach what you needed to do. And believe me, if you get rid of the PLA2R, the, anti, the proteinuria is going to go down. There is no question about that. This is like an airplane in the sky. If you switch the engines, it will fall. If it doesn't fall, then you have to find the trick. And I, I, I mean, if people, that, that people say, ah, oh, you cannot, PLA2 is not a good biomarker. Bullshit. If you can show me that this is a case that this doesn't happen, then you rebiopsy because something else is doing that is not PLA2R members. If the proteinuria remains because there's something else, is not because of that. The other patient that I like to show to you is this one, all right? And uh, this is a patient that um, 2015, he was treated outside, he got treated with acrolimus, and then he got treated uh, in, um, uh, didn't uh, la didn't go, I mean, this is the proteinuria, his proteinuria was about uh, 7.5 grams, and um, he, uh, got toxicity of tacrolimus stopped, then they gave him uh, rituximab and um, together with uh, cyclosporin, but that resulted, you see that can patient comes with a creatinine goes up to 6.5. And by the time he came to Mayo, his creatinine was 4.5, but here is was his proteinuria. His proteinuria was 7.5 grams. So at that time, I said, well, let's give you prednisone and cyclophosphate, the same business that we did before. And I gave him, but the patient was on this for about uh, uh, six months. Proteinuria came down, but as soon as we stopped the prednisone cyclophosphate, boom, proteinuria went up, all right? And then I said, well, are you going to do now? What? And the creatinine was high. And you have to see, but Fernando, you're crazy treating a patient with a creatinine of 6.5. Don't you have a point of no return in members of the property? And again, this is why you cannot give guidelines. You have to use clinical practice. You have to know that the kidney biopsy in 2015 that has no interstitial fibrosis there. And the ultrasound of this patient will show normal size kidney with no increase of cardiomyopathy. So you can say this six, is 6.5 because, but this is ATN because the patient is massive nephrotic. And therefore, I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt and I will treat this patient. And then at that time, there was this drug that was became available called, I mean, it was not available, well, it was available some years later, but Ofatumumab, that's a more powerful version of Rituximab. And we gave Ofatumumab 300 milligrams, and you can see that with each dose of Ofatumumab, Tortonuria come back, but Tortonuria come back, and then, but then it will go up, all right? And again, you say, but well, what is the business? What Fernando is showing it? And you can see that as the patient is start improving, his creatinine start going down and down. All right. And then, but what was the business? The business was here. All right. This was the PLA2R levels. You see the PLA2R level was very high, 270, and you treat with methylprednisone and, and cytoxin. But when you stop the PLA2R, shoot back. And then we gave ofatumumab. And you see the PLA2R go down, up and down, but up and down, and it will go down, but they will rebound. It will go down and rebound. And the other thing you have to take into account is the B cells, all right? You have to, the, the argument is that you use the B cells to, to monitor, because if the B cells are zero, then you don't need to retreat this patient, all right? You just wait. But if the B cell come back and the PLA2R is positive, then you reshoot. And then this patient, uh, we continue to treat, but you can see that the short leave, I mean, in one sense, it, it, you, he was getting like ofatumumab almost every couple of, uh, every six months. So in 2020, uh, ofat obinituzumab, that is a more powerful anti-CD20 antibody was, was present. So we decided to treat him with OB and we gave him two doses of obinituzumab. And you can see that the two doses of obinituzumab here resulted in so profound depletion that this was 220 and to the patient I told you was here like a couple of weeks ago, 
and he remained this uh, PLA to add zero, all right, for all this, uh, 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 like four years, three years, almost four years later, all right, although now the B cells are coming back, but the B cells are coming back, but the PLA to add is negative, so I don't need to do anything, I don't need to retreat the patient, and this is his creatinine clearance. You can see that the patient is starting with a creatinine clearance around 25, 20. And this was the creatinine clearance uh, two weeks ago, about 65 mLs per minute. So this is another illustration that when the point of no return it is individualized medicine, you have to look at the, you just don't take, you, don't, you just don't take a creatinine or a clearance and uh, use that as a make your decision when to treat or not to treat. You have to take the contents of the patient. I mean, if the patient had come and say, well, three years ago, his, before his creatinine was three, then uh, two years ago, his creatinine was 4.5, and now he comes with creatinine six. Oh, well, then, of course, I'm not going to do this because this is chronic. But if I knew that 12 months ago, creatinine was normal, and now comes, that, that is not the unless you can show that this patient had a crescentic uh, uh, gene on top of membranes, then you say, and you look at the ultrasound and his kidneys and look normal, and you say, this is ATN, let's go ahead, and well, that's the story. So, and I see this is the story. I try to illustrate two cases where you one fail rituximab, but how we can rescue them with low dose, uh, with cyclophos, with short cause of cyclophosphate. In another one, with the use of uh, another anti-CD20 antibody for patients who have failed rituximab. And we, I didn't have time, but we published uh, three cases. And then also people from Cedar sinai published, like OB is a more, more powerful. So in, um, the problem is to, in the United States to convince Shunas company with they are stupid. by Because not they are stupid, they just want to make money. But in the US, OB and rituximab are the same price. So why are we going to treat rituximab if I can get double the benefit with OB for the same money? But uh, sometimes insurance don't get it anyway. Well, thank you, Dr. Fermenza. That was amazing. And uh, just to give the, the listeners uh, an impression, the first case is also published in this treatment um, standard in NDD. I have a couple of questions. So first is you're doing the Majesty trial. So that's a combination of obinutuzumab versus Decrolinus. When do we expect the top line results of this trial? Ah, well, it's just finished last month, finished recruiting. So this is not going to come for another couple of years. I don't think so. Good. But how many patients did you recruit into Majesty in total? At Mayo? No, overall. It's 150 something. Very good. I mean, it's a no-brainer, all right? I mean, in principle, how the story is. But, so you people are going to ask, but what is this no-brainer? I mean, you are talking, mentor was rituximab versus cyclosporin. Now you are doing OB versus tacronin. What do you expect that the answer is going to? Well, we hope, I mean, we believe they actually are, they are, they, the answer is going to be obvious. But the answer is because they have to be done because of FDA approved. I mean, the FDA wants, uh, all right. And, and um, so that's that's the reason we have to do for, because if you don't get approval, then you get the issue that we have in now. You prescribe and the insurance company say, ah, it's not FDA approved, we're not giving, we're not covering. So that's the point. So in cases with a GFR, which is preserved, BLA2 receptor antibody positive, um, when would you perform a kidney biopsy based on your excellent data? Well, if a patient has normal kidney function, EGFR is normal, and there is yes. no evidence of secondary disease and no diabetes, I would not perform a kidney biopsy. I would treat the patient and ask questions later. All right? Now, if the patient is diabetic, has diabetes, there is no way you can differentiate diabetic nephropathy, superimpose, or member, whatever. So you have to biopsy this. Now, with the patients who come with abnormal kidney function, I mean, with IGFR less than 60, remember, you don't need much to get IGFR less than 60, all right? You have a, you come with a creatinine 1.2, is the IGFR is already 58, all right? So you biopsy this patient. And in this patient, Dr. Orsetti, Sanjeev saw many of these, you saw a couple of crescentic interstitial nephritis, uh, 
um, you know, so interesting that uh, thing that you take into consideration, right? But I have when people like try to criticize, and I have dear friends that uh, we travel together, whatever, like Dato, like uh, Dario Rocatello from Turin and others. Oh, but we have to biopsy because biopsy is so safe and blah blah blah. And I keep arguing, I said, it's yeah, but just because it's safe doesn't mean that um, you know it's free, Gunnar. So come here, I'm going to do a biopsy of your kidney. You're not going to pay anything. I just put a needle. I mean, come on. If this was the story. So what I like to say to these people, they like to uh, show me your data, all right? That get your centers, put collect all together. People that you have members of the property, that you have uh, normal EGFR, that you look and they have no non-steroidal, no drug, no mercury, uh, that they have no uh, uh, cancer, that they have no autoimmune disease, and um, they have no hepatitis. And that you did a biopsy and they are clearly to are positive. And that you did a biopsy and you and now with your GFR board and you found something that significantly changed your uh, management. Well, then I will buy. But then you have to show me. Blah 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 doesn't count, all right? You know, you have to go and publish. Before you continue, Andreas, which is your approach in Innsbruck? <laughs> Well, I think we're going with the same strategy. So if there is normal GFR and clear cuts, you know, PLR2 receptor, antibody positive, we don't biopsy, except, you know, if there is some concomitant disease. But I would also be interested in understanding if you do see like double positives, like we see, for instance, in anchor GN plus anti GPM. Oh, you see, PLR2. ah, that's a G. Can I, a G will answer you. Come, <laughs> so. You know the the, the double positive the, the double positives are based on IHC essentially. You know, yes. and there's a lot of stickiness in some of these these antibodies that you use. When you do mass spec studies, the double positivity invariably disappears. I've not seen, and now we are close to five five hundred cases where we've done mass spec for determining these antigens, and not a single case I've ever seen of two cases going together. Uh, so my own feeling is that it's a case of uh, antibodies that are sort of sticky, and it's all based on uh, based on IHC that you have double positivity. In the serum, there have been some cases. They have been told. I've been told that there are, but uh, I, I it's hard to believe for me to believe that data. Yeah, we had an argument with General Lambeau. Yeah. Because the book came and said, "Oh, but I did." I said, "Well, well, we have not seen those cases. I have not seen a single case." Of double. In fact, it's like amyloid, same story, AL and AAA. And as soon as you do, because A is very sticky, and as soon as you do mass spec, the other one disappears. They're all based on immunohistochemistry. So, um, I mean, in kidney biopsies, you don't necessarily see CD20 positive cells, right? And you do, very few. You do, but and we did that. We published this years ago when we first did our first rituximab study. And then we did the second, and we stayed for CD20. But of course, the small numbers, Andreas. Uh, and the first mm -hmm. study was 15 patients. The second study was 20. And we saw some CD20 positive cells there, but we couldn't correlate really the what number of these CD20 with anything. But what about CD38 and the rationale for daratumumab in these patients? You mentioned that in the in the treatment standard manuscript. Do you yes. see a lot of CD38? Yeah, well, we have not stained yeah, for the CD38, but the, the rationale, in fact, I mean, you know better than me, all right? And I think this has been, uh, we participated because it was uh, with um, uh, with um, with a German company, uh, um, what's the name of the... Um, uh, is it during, during morphosis right? with morphosis? We did a study. I mean, we didn't, uh, um, and uh, in the, the obvious reason that we thought about that, oh, Santa CD38 is because we do know, like Sanjeev said, about the 90% of the patients you know that you can uh, say what is the antigen. Well, 90% of the patients uh, you can treat with cytoxin and rituximab or whatever, but. There is ten percent of the group of the patients that do not respond to anything, and they are rare. And in fact, I like to say, 
those patients are PLA2 are negative. And I see them like once a year, I see one of those patients that come with a protein urea of 20 grams and uh, and you they have been treated outside uh, and they say, ah, now I'm going to give you, I give you obinutuzumab, you give cytoxin, you give both together and they continue with 20 and then the creatinine start going up and up and up and within 12, 18 months, those patients have lost the kidney. And, and they are not PLA2R. And uh, we have biopsy as soon and try to see if we find the antigens and we couldn't find what, I mean, what is the story is. So it makes an attractive idea that well, for then those patients, so then maybe you give anti-CD38, whatever. But the point is the anti-CD38, I mean, at least on the morphosis study, and it has been shown in, I, don't, I never saw the manuscript. And when I don't see a manuscript, it's because likely there was not so much excitement in the data. I mean, there was some um, abstracts that we presented at the ASN. In um, some patients, and I see more folks, if I sold that thing to a way to uh, bio or whatever, it is because of that. I see they treated, but it was not, a, it was not a, let me tell you this way, the response it was not anti-CD20, all right? I seen all the 10 patients they treated, maybe one of those went into remission and the other two or three maybe lost some proteinuria and the other did nothing. So it, it doesn't appear that at least, again, we you always have to remember the devil is in the detail, all right? And remember with this treatment, they gave like eight doses, but we don't give eight doses. If you are treating myeloma, we don't give anti CD20 and the CD38 weight doses, you keep constantly for uh, forever, all right? And if we give a PGMID, we give 16 doses of uh, uh, anti CD38. So is that anti CD38 not responsive or is because the dose was inadequate, um, whatever? I have to, on the other hand, you have to also remember that one dose of anti CD38, one dose of daratumumab, for example, in the United States, cost $18,000. So if you give 10 doses, we are talking about $180,000 for 10 doses of daratumumab. And um, so the question is, why do we, I mean, then you shouldn't use that indiscriminate because in fact, the majority of those patients will respond to cytoxin or will respond to CD20. So data, you can try into those, into this, uh, but then people are going to say, why are you going to spend this? I get bortosamide if I need those patients that uh, try bortosamide, that is cheaper, all right? So mm -hmm. that, there you have it. But also more side effects. And what about in such refractory disease, what about CAR T cells? Do you think there is a role? Yeah. In cases? I I seen that. Um, and in fact, yeah. there are patients trying, there are uh, now the, you, the companies that are trying to, to do that. CAR T uh, uh, therapy. The, the the question of the CAR T therapy, uh, which I I have um, um, think is that uh, the CAR T therapy is also a very big gun. All right, and it would be good if you could. Um, um, I mean, it would be good. I mean, remember that also is not now we are finding a lot of side effects. I mean, people inform whatever. But of course, the counter argument said, well, yeah, but, uh, but then you are doing this to cancer and then you have to be a profound depletion, blah, blah, blah. But if we could have an antigen, like say CD20, like uh, anti PLA2R, then you can just select a CAR T against to deplete CD uh, B cells that are targeting anti -P they're producing PLA2R. So you can, you can um, envision that you can have a more target approach less. But I told you that uh, the problem with these patients that are resistant, that they are not anti-PLA2 are positive, they are not NL1, what they are, I don't know. So this target approach, at least at the moment, you won't. So you will have to use heavy, because you cannot select, uh, now I'm going to treat anti, we're going to deplete the anti-PLA2 or clone on this patient because you don't know what the clone is. So yeah, again, is um I think it is um for this patient I think probably that is um that was something that you you should be considered. Completely other story and much more practical. Do you perform 
a basic malignancy screen in all patients? Absolutely. Well, I, I, you have to do, like, for example, yesterday, you have to also remember the story. You always have to do that. I, I uh, Especially in age. If the patient is greater than uh, 50 years old, you have to have a colonoscopy, all right? Uh, especially, I mean, of course, you can say the yield is very low. If, like, you see a patient that is 55, but he comes with you with 10 grams of proteinuria, but a hemoglobin of 14.8, it's unlikely that this guy has colonic cancer, right? But then you, you should cross the, the, the... So what I do, I do a chest X-ray. If the patient is a like smoker, whatever, then I do a CT scan. The ultrasound is a given because you have to do the ultrasound to write a PSA for the prostate or a mammogram for the story and a colonoscopy. And, and that's what I basically what I do. I mean, if there is anything more, then the patient they will give you a clue. All right. If there is uh, that something is wrong. If the patient comes with a creatinine of what, but a hemoglobin of eight, then of course, in a, then this patient you have to look. Does it have a monoclonal protein? Does it have a cancer? Because this is not the right story. The other thing what I take the opportunity, yesterday I talked to the fellows, is that remember, this I have a case years ago. Patient came with membrane nephropathy, all right, at age uh, 50, all right, treated at that time with Ponticelli, all right, went into remission. 12 years later, he appears with a relapse, all right? So, the idea said, well, let's treat it again, all right? But then I said, no, no, no. Yeah, but let's start from time zero. Let's pretend you are a new one. Let's do all the same basis. Bingo, we did the ultrasound and have a hypernephroma. So just because the patient presented at age 50 with nothing, doesn't mean that the re when he relapses at 12 years later, that he does not, that is idiopathic, that he may have an hour. So you have to remember this, that just because in the past was nothing, this time maybe we associated or associated with something else. So that's it. That's what you have to remember. Two questions from my part. So, well, first one we already discussed three years ago, but things may change. So you told us when we last met, if I remember correctly, your default strategy when you go with rituximab, you don't use any steroids and also when you go with calcium immune inhibitors you also do not regularly use steroids so that's just for cyclophosphamide this combination correct there is and no justification of using steroids the story is that the, the 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 steroid business comes from the transplant uh, literature that they thought that if you give a little bit of steroids you would protect the kidney from calcium toxicity the bullshit, we know that. that. And there is also a good paper that uh, people they publish in MDT, all right? That is uh, Alexopoulos, I think, that years ago showed that if you give a little bit of uh, prednisone and with cyclosporine, that you prevent relapse better than cyclosporine monotherapy. But that is all explained if you really look again, the devil is in the detail, all right? All is explained if you look at the detail. The people who are on cyclosporine plus prednisone, in fact, had higher levels of cyclosporine in circulation. So to me, there is nothing to do with the prednisone. It has to do because they have higher levels of the cyclosporine. End of the story, all right? So that is the, that was the issue. And then I would like to challenge you at the end of our talk. So uh, both in the KDGO guidelines and also in your recent NDT papers, you still argue that if we go for anticoagulation and you would recommend anticoagulation at least when people have an albumin below 20 or below two, depending on the units you, your lab uses, you still recommend us to go either for a vitamin K antagonist or for heparins. Now, Anne Friese is a close collaborator of you and she showed admittedly in dialysis patients, so not really GN patients, all these risks of vitamin K antagonists. Shouldn't we go for DOACs in 2024? I, 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 I entirely agree, but I think, remember the business or the story of the end of risk versus what we are talking. And is talking about patients on dialysis or atrial fibrillation that you are going to keep them on coagulation for life. We are talking about the coagulation of those patients for six months. As soon as the albumin goes above three, 
I stop anticoagulation. Or as soon as the proteinuria comes below 3.5, the patient gets off anticoagulation. So we are not talking about keeping those patients uh, forever. But I think that a new people, and if you want to be the devil advocate, the people say, well, but we don't have any data on the new anticoagulants, whatever. I think this is bullshit. I think the only the only data that really would force me not to give this new is the patient has antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, because I think that is, I think the data is more solid. But if the patient is member of property, if you want to give uh, whatever, I think it's fine with me. Whatever you want to give, I think it's fine. Well, thank you, Fernando and Sanjay, for this thank educational you. hour for us. Uh, it was amazing, as always. Um, we really like membranous nephropathy, all of us. A bit of advertisement at the end. We will have a Mayo Clinic meeting in Salzburg, Austria, next May. And uh, we will welcome Fernando in person and Sanjay uh, virtually. And everybody is more than welcome to join in person in a very beautiful city and with uh, exceptional lineup from the Mayo Clinic and also from elsewhere. So thank you very much for this nice hour. Thank you. Thank you, good art. Thank you, Krupi Thank Care. you. Thank you.